Today, we're going to take a virtual aerial tour from Miramichi to Fredericton in New Brunswick. Or rather, I should say we're going to tour New Brunswick's fast clear cuts. Now I've been filming from the ground and from the air, the forestry disaster of the Atlantic provinces of Canada for about a decade, mostly concentrating my work in the region of Nova Scotia. And I have to say from the outset, I thought I had seen it bad. But I'll tell you right now at the beginning, in my entire life, I have never seen such a mess anywhere from the far north of Alaska to the southern borders of the USA than I have seen when it comes to the state of the forest in New Brunswick. Before deciding to do this virtual flight over this region of New Brunswick, I studied satellite imagery of the area. And from space, the depleted condition of the entire province's forest is obvious. But to be very frank, what one can perceive from space simply does not adequately portray the devastating reality. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. And you'll see exactly why in the course of this video. For once we get a little past the primary inhabited areas, everywhere you look, the forest has been leveled. And all the way from Miramichi to Fredericton, I honestly don't know if one can find a square foot of intact forest. Yes, you'll see trees and tree stands, but virtually everywhere. They show the images of scarring, of having been cut and recut and recut, sprayed with glyphosate to kill the native forests, and converted through tree farming to become the coniferous woods that form pulpwood and lumber plantations. Speaking from the perspective of a conservationist, I simply don't know where the native animals of New Brunswick are supposed to find shelter or food in these conditions. And hunters who may be wondering what happened to New Brunswick's once robust white-tailed deer population, watch this video and you'll find out. Animals need a habitat, and the once gorgeous countryside of New Brunswick that existed everywhere, just off the road, it's gone. And if you think you see woods, you see but an illusion. Cosmetic hedges left to hide the real damage of those unbelievable clear cuts done on a scale so titanic that I can only describe it as biblical level destruction. To take this virtual flight, we're going to use some amazing new technology, the Microsoft Flight Simulator version 2020. This is the latest iteration of this application which has been around for decades and long been used to allow pilots and aspiring pilots to get their sim time in. I often use drones to capture videography and Canada these days requires all drone pilots to have certification. So in order to fly my best, maintain safety and abide aviation regulations, I often practice flying with highly accurate flight simulators. But what is different and special about the Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is that the imagery portrayed in its virtual environment is directly drawn from the real world through satellite imagery. As one uses the flight simulator, it continuously downloads data on local air traffic, weather conditions, and the land itself. And by applying a technology called photogrammetry, it converts that satellite data into a highly accurate 3D representation so that pilots can accurately practice skills such as flying by visual landmarks. In practical terms, what this means for us is that the world you are going to see portrayed is in fact what is really there. Photogrammetry is a developing technology, and here and there it makes small errors. It may misinterpret, for example, the height or color of a building if the satellite imagery does not capture it well. Another common error is that it sometimes misinterprets water levels based on differing data provided through measures at different times of the year. These amounts of small rendering bugs that will be worked out with a bit more time in development and they apply mainly to water bodies and urban areas. But when using the flight simulator to travel over rural areas and wild areas, what you will see out the window is almost exactly what you would perceive were you to go to that location and look around for yourself. The virtual tour you are going to take today is an almost completely accurate representation of the state of New Brunswick's forest flying between Miramichi and Fredericton. I want you, the viewer, to be able to experience this flight as closely as possible to that you would experience if you were to take a real flight over this region. To focus on what you're going to perceive, we're going to ignore air traffic control and concentrate on touring the world below. We've already taken off from the Miramichi Airport and are presently climbing to our cruise altitude of 6,000 feet at the rate of about 500 feet per minute. Because the flight simulator uses actual satellite imagery, when the aircraft is close to the ground, it must make assumptions about objects' appearances and textures, which gives them a simulated look. But as we ascend, the more the simulator can rely upon the textures and hues portrayed in the satellite imagery, so things take on a photoreal look. But whether from the perspective of very close to the ground or at altitude, the flight sim is using actual satellite data to portray the world with great accuracy. 
I cannot emphasize this enough. What you will see in this virtual flight is what you would see were you to really fly over this region from the air at 6,000 feet. So for the first dozen miles or so, as we travel south out of Miramichi, the landscape is relatively intact, transforming from a smallish urban community rapidly into farms and country dwellings. Forestry cartels such as Irving, which predominates the forestry operations in the province of New Brunswick, like to keep their forestry practices, let us say, in the shadows. So the forest damage tends to be done somewhat away from cities, and usually off main roads, so that tourists and the local population don't much see it, and, ideally, remain unaware. And when they do conduct cutting operations near main roads, typically they leave what I have come to call cosmetic hedges of anywhere from a dozen to a few dozen meters thick between that road and the clear cuts, so that passers-by won't be able to perceive the damage. A relatively narrow hedge is very effective at concealing a clear cut from the ground, but I can guarantee you, if you go to almost any rural road in Nova Scotia and you think you're in forest, stop your vehicle and get out and walk 100 meters or so and odds are very high you're going to find yourself standing in a clear cut. We are still here in a fairly inhabited area and we see lots of forests interspersed with small yards and meadows and the pastures and fields of farms. From the air, those clearings can be distinguished from clear cuts in that they tend to be smaller, patchier, less regular, and if fresh, don't show fresh dirt, or the symmetrical scarring in the land of heavy timber harvesting machinery, or if 10 to 20 years older, the scrub-like conditions of newly growing woods, or if older still, the broken canopy and darkness of disruptive conifer woods. What I mean by disruptive conifer woods is this. The pulp and timber cartels tell the general public that it's perfectly okay to cut the woods, because not only will the woods grow back, but they replant them neither of which is really true in any meaningful sense. A group of trees does not a forest make. A mature, healthy forest takes many centuries to develop, as it slowly develops a deep and friable soil and becomes home to innumerable organisms that not only are not very good at moving around when their habitat is destroyed, but serve to strengthen and reinforce that soil. And when the forest is cut away, those organisms are destroyed Erosion begins, the richness of the soil is lost, and the biodiversity of that forest is destroyed, and it can and will take centuries to redevelop. So it is simply not possible, nor realistic, to imagine cutting a forest and that it just magically grows back. But this is not the end of the forestry cartel's deception, because very often in New Brunswick, native trees are destroyed to make room for conifers. As those clear cuts attempt to heal and redevelop, the native hardwood species of trees, considered weeds by the forestry industry, are destroyed, sometimes mechanically, directly by cutting them down, but often by spraying toxic herbicides such as glyphosate repeatedly upon that forest to kill the forest attempts to regrow its native trees and ecosystem. And to add insult to injury, at least as far as New Brunswick residents are concerned, the province's taxpayers are forced to pay for these glyphosate treatments, which is to say that every single person living in New Brunswick who pays taxes is forced to subsidize the profit-making arm of companies like Irving and other forestry cartel companies that exist within that province. We're about 20 miles or so out of Miramichi now, and if you look down below the port window, you'll see some reddish rounded clearings these are often signs of natural clearings, where the ground may be low and too wet or rocky for woods to grow. But all around that patchwork clearing, one begins to see the immense scarring of the land. Those simple white lines lead to those scars. Those are typically forestry access roads, often dirt and simply bulldozed out of the landscape. And the pale patches you're now seeing are a vast collection of clear cuts. They are always paler than uncut forest, and where they show reddish or pale green, those clear cuts are very fresh, exposing bare earth and new herbaceous growth. In the very dark patches where you think you may be seeing healthy forest, those are coniferous tree farms that have been allowed to regrow. The native hardwood forests of New Brunswick have broad leaves of a paler green, so they show up as forest too, but a bit lighter. We're going to look to the right now, and notice in the green patch in the middle of the screen out of the starboard window, very near the base of the window, the pale lines, those are scars of old logging roads. You'll see such pale lines throughout the trees on this side of the river. This is forest that has been mostly cut over and is now partially regrown. Notice how dispersed the treetops look. This is because these are young woods that have not yet had time to grow enough to form a complete canopy. They cannot shelter the ground from the harsh sun, which makes the ground poor at holding water. 
so that in dry years, the trees become desiccated, making them vulnerable to blights and more prone to forest fires. And out of the port window we're flying into more of the same. Endless forestry roads, clear cuts, and the scarred woods that have been cut and are barely, partially grown back, dark green as the native hardwood forest have been intentionally destroyed. Right down there, at about 11 o'clock low off the front of the aircraft, at the end of the logging road, left of center picture, and seen to right up against the edge of the aircraft, you can see the symmetrical rows that indicate heavy machinery operations in the forest that I was talking about. These are the paths that have been followed by huge machines which travel through the woods and clip them down like giant pruning shears. These machines are so big that they can dig ruts two to four feet into the soil destroying the microorganisms that are so important and essential in maintaining soil health, crushing the root systems that keep the soil from eroding, and compressing the soil so that it loses much of its capacity to store water. At about one o'clock, we see the little roads and patchwork that indicate a rural community. Notice the swath of green hugging that community. No one likes looking at the ugly scarred reality of clear cuts, so stands of woods are left to hide it. We can see here to the left, only a few miles away, where, insofar as I can tell, the entire landscape, every last square foot, is either in the process of being clear-cut, or is recently, within the last several decades, been clear-cut, and is at some early to moderate stage of regrowth. If you've ever heard lumberyard workers, or forestry workers, commenting that the trees they harvest are so small now, you can see why just looking down there. Every last bit of landscape that I can see below the airplane has been clear-cut sometime relatively recently within the lifespan of trees. There are no mature woods anywhere, I mean not anywhere, and that's looking at the landscape from the perspective of 6,000 feet in the sky, where we can see miles and miles into the distance. Foresters come back with matchsticks, because that's all that's left. To the right of the aircraft here you can see the roads of that small community, and here you should take note of how forest has been left standing all around that community, even the lighter green of deciduous forests. And yet, if we look away, ahead of the aircraft and off to the left, we see the endless stretches of clear cuts just outside that little community. This is the way things are done in my experience all throughout the Atlantic provinces. The forests are cut, these cosmetic hedges and patches are left to conceal the true extent of the damage. And all around us, the native landscape that our ancestors knew, even only a generation ago, vanishes along with the wildlife that depended on it. We're going to switch to an external view here to give you a fuller perspective of the damage. At the base of the image, you will see what might appear to be healthy woods, but the widely separated tree crowns indicate this is clear-cut woods, partly in regrowth. Directly ahead, you can see a more recent completely bare clear cut, and to the left, you can see a semi-bare opening where the scrub wood, before the trees were likely anywhere near mature, were cut again. This destruction of the Atlantic Province's native Acadian forest has been referred to by biologists and ecologists as borealization. Because as New Brunswick's native woods are cut away, when your forestry cartels say they replant those forests, they are actually replanting trees they prefer to farm a very narrow species range of coniferous trees. In the far north, the forests are predominantly conifers, the backbone of boreal woods, whereas in our region there should be a very rich blend of tree species, especially hardwoods. But as noted a moment ago, those hardwood trees are intentionally destroyed by the forestry cartels because they consider them generally to be weed trees. They want conifers, which give straight quick wood for timber, and give the kind of pulp that they want for processing by pulp mills. And at 9 o'clock, just below the left wing, you can see another one of those vast tree farms being created. But see the green band in the middle? Notice there's a road going down it. Just a backwoods road, yes. See how there's a hedge of trees on both sides of that road? This is intentionally done to hide the clear cut. So, borealization in this instance refers to the intentional destruction of the Atlantic Province's native Acadian forest and the replacement of those forests with conifers so that they emulate boreal woods. This is a problem that is now widespread and far-reaching, so that it is actually becoming very difficult to find healthy Acadian woods anywhere in the maritime provinces. 
And in fact, less than 1% of old growth Acadian forest remains. Very, very little upon which to have any hope of rebuilding a broken ecosystem. That this has happened at all in New Brunswick is very much the result of deception and corruption and to a degree, willful ignorance. Right down there, more tree farms in action. More places where New Brunswick's Acadian forest is being borealized. The willful ignorance that has allowed the apocalyptic destruction of New Brunswick's native forest, I am convinced has resulted from the forestry industry's determination to view the forest as a resource to be mined. I have not seen any real nor meaningful respect for the forest as an ecosystem that sustains not only a variety of species but also us, by cleaning water and purifying air and retaining the soil against erosion, as well as capturing carbon, mitigating climate change. The forest is a resource to be mined, and the general public are told that when it's cut, it's replanted. And I've heard many foresters themselves say, when you cut it, it grows back thicker and stronger. Well, if it grows back thicker, it's because the trees can no longer make a natural canopy to maintain on their own a healthy growing distance. But really what is allowed to grow back are tree farms, innately prone to blights and forest fires. While referring to deception and corruption, I have been documenting the clear-cutting of the Maritime Provinces forest for years, as I said earlier. There has been outright denial and determined obfuscation of the damage being done to the woods. Damage that I revealed in my virtual flight over the Kejimkuchik National Park region, where all around the outskirts of the park, for hundreds if not thousands of square miles, the native forests have been clear-cut away. Biologists such as the retired Bob Bancroft have told me about their own experiences within the Department of Lands and Forestries in Nova Scotia, his concerns about clear-cutting practices, and how they were dismissed out of hand. Well-known writers who cover issues such as these, like Joan Baxter, author and journalist, have told me about their research of corporate capture, in which the forestry industry has inserted personnel with its interest into offices of government and departments of forestry, conservation, and environment with the goal of influencing policy. And most recently, Joanne Baxter wrote the illuminating article, The Borealization of Acadia, published by the Halifax Examiner, in which she wrote about a study by Joshua Noseworthy and UMB professor Tom Beckley that voiced concern about this process of borealization. A representative of the Irving Corporation contacted the professor's dean at the Department of the University of New Brunswick to express, shall we say, concern over the use of the term borealization. It is bizarre that the JDI Corporation, if they had a question about the term borealization or the findings of Noseworthy and Beckley, did not contact the authors themselves to ask their questions. Rather, they contacted the Dean, an action which might reasonably be interpreted as an attempt to apply pressure on the researchers. When JDI was questioned about their conduct, they replied in this fashion. We did reach out to the Dean of Forestry at UNB to ask for the peer-reviewed science so we could better understand the issue. Our question regarding whether Dr. Beckley's research has undergone this level of peer scrutiny was, is, not exceptional. It is curious that Dr. Beckley would take exception to this standard academic practice. Peer review, in our estimation, is a level of scrutiny that separates opinion from fact. Dr. Beckley used the term borealization during the CBC interview in March 2018. This is not a term that we are familiar with as trained foresters, and as of this writing, we are not aware of any peer-reviewed science that demonstrates borealization of Acadian forests. Following our request, the Dean reached out to Dr. Beckley for the peer review of the research and none could be produced. Joanne Baxter goes on to describe how surprised Dr. Beckley and Noseworthy were by JDI's actions and statements. They had never heard of borealization before as trained foresters? I'm not a trained forester and I've been familiar with the concept of borealization for many, many years. And personally, I can only interpret JDI's statement if I were to be charitable, as gross but unintentional ignorance of their field and how the work influences the environment. But experience has not led me to be charitable in my interpretation. And I believe it is reasonable to consider their actions to be both deceptive and a willful attempt to harass Dr. Beckley and Noseworthy. For a simple Google search of the term borealization and its implications pulls up by page two articles dating back as far as 2007, and I recall studying the concepts long before then when I was an undergrad. Given that this is a long time, long established concept among scientists, I find it astounding and impossible to believe that JDI was in any way unaware of borealization and what causes it and what it implies.
So New Brunswick's forests are being clear cut away, and as you've seen so far, once you get outside the sight of towns and villages and roads, the damage is extensive, it is everywhere. Let's take a swan dive down to low altitude and have a look at some of these cuts up close and personal. Hang tight because this will take a minute. Only stunt and military aircraft are capable of making nose dives, and ordinary working aircraft such as this simulated X-Cub could shred its wings if it were to go too fast. We're going to descend fast, but we're going to have to break all the way by applying flaps and fishtailing with the rudder. Notice the apparent greenery around the aircraft. It is easy for a person untrained in the interpretation of aerial imagery to think that is forest. Well, it's trees. But notice the distinct spacing between the individual trees and the brownish coloration you can often see between them. That is the appearance of woods that have been clear cut and are now only partially regrown. The trees do not form a complete canopy, which is absolutely essential for the formation of healthy mature forest and that in places you can see the soil between the trees indicates the foliage cover is not thorough. This can result from the soil being hard packed due to heavy tree harvesting machinery that's passed over it in the past, or that the soil has inadequate cover of foliage due to previous applications of glyphosate to kill the native deciduous trees, but which also kills all the native plants that grow underneath it, everything but the conifers really, and so has left the ground with inadequate plant cover. If you can see the bare earth due to compression of the soil, the below ground mycelia and microorganisms will be partially destroyed and unable to make the soil healthy, and the compressed ground will be poor at retaining water. But if the ground is visible, because it has inadequate foliage cover due to forestry operations, it will be subject to easy erosion and dehydration. Ahead of the plane and just off the left window, at 9 through 11 o'clock we see the rows that indicate the work of heavy tree harvesting machinery and or replanting operations. You should always bear in mind that when the forestry cartel says it cuts and then replants a forest, that is anything but the truth. They do not replant the native trees that grew in that area. They replant a monocrop of conifers, whichever conifers they feel will best suit their desires for pulper timber. And the native, healthy forest which was there in its place is gone. When you see a collection of replanted trees, I have to emphasize, you do not see a forest. You are simply seeing a tree farm. A true and healthy forest is biodiverse hosting a wide variety of herbaceous and tree species, which in turn provide food and shelter for a wide variety of wildlife. By contrast, a tree farm is more aptly described as a green desert. It's green, it has trees, but it does very little to support healthy soil or feed or shelter wildlife. In a previous video, Firebomb Forest, I discussed how these tree farms become dangerous fire hazards, and New Brunswickers, I suggest you take a look at that video because it's not speculation. Deciduous trees are by nature extremely resistant to forest fire. On the off hand, there is a forest fire, they typically quickly put it out themselves. Coniferous trees, on the other hand, the trees preferred for tree farming operations, are filled with an oily pitch that is used by the trees to repel insect attacks and as antifreeze. Unfortunately, this pitch is inflammable and it's very easy to light. A tree farm of conifers can very aptly be compared to a forest fire waiting to happen. And in that video, Firebomb Forest, I demonstrate just how easy it is to light conifers compared to deciduous trees by simply holding a lighter to their wooden pitch. After nearly 30 seconds, a bunch of deciduous twigs simply would not light. They barely even smoked, whereas the coniferous trees lit almost instantly. So we're flying just over this old logging road there's a partially regrown clear cut just beneath us, and we're coming up on another clear cut just ahead. Notice the patches of exposed soil between the trees. Those patches indicate just how unhealthy this landscape is following forestry operations. Let's say the forest were to burn by way of a massive forest fire. The forest fire would barely damage the soil. It would still remain loamy, able to hold water, and the below ground root structure, even the roots of dead plants, would still protect soil from erosion until foliage regrew. And foliage would begin to grow rather quickly because the ash from the forest fire would fertilize the soil. And seeds laid down by the foliage over previous years would then soon germinate. 
Herbaceous plants and pioneer trees such as willows and birches would rapidly take over the area and then slowly transform in a moderated, healthy, natural fashion back into a mature forest. But this land has been repeatedly brutalized by forestry operations. Heavy machinery and applications of glyphosate have killed the woods and the soil. It will take centuries to recover. We've seen all we need to see here. Let's climb back up to 6,000 feet and continue on our way to Fredericton. As we climb, if you look out the starboard window, you can see the scarred rows of recent harvesting and tree replanting operations, forestry access roads everywhere, and a patchwork landscape of a forest that has been cut and recut in every direction that you look. And at this altitude, it is even easier to perceive. I don't think I see a single acre of land down there where the forest has not been cut, except for possibly right along the river, due to somewhat stringent regulations that mandate that forestry workers are supposed to leave trees standing along waterways to cool the water for fish and provide some protection for the water course. But as we circled the aircraft the last few hundred feet back up to 6,000 feet, and we spin around in every direction, you can see a scarred, butchered forest as far as you can see in every single direction. And bear in mind, this is 6,000 feet. The horizon is a very long way away. Over the many years that I have been studying clear cuts, I had thought I had seen some real messes, especially around Kejimkujik National Park in Nova Scotia. But I have not seen anything in North America that can really compare to the absolute damage to the forest that I'm seeing in New Brunswick. The damage is so vast and so far reaching that at this point, just 26 minutes into this flight, it's starting to take on a repetitive feel. When I've looked at other landscapes, whether through the camera of a drone, an actual aircraft, or the satellite imagery presented here in the Microsoft Flight Simulator, at least the clear cuts are surrounded by somewhat regrown woods. But here, the landscape has simply been butchered. I don't know of any other word for it. The damage is of an apocalyptic scale. For those of you who are deer hunters who may be wondering where New Brunswick's deer are going, here's your answer. There is simply no healthy environment down there for their numbers to flourish. If you cut your native forest and then spray glyphosate everywhere, which then destroys your native flora, the deer have nowhere to shelter and they have nothing to eat and they aren't going to find much in the way of food nor shelter in a conifer tree plantation. Walk through one and you'll see why. The soil is dry. The variety of foliage is simple. Often the trees are so dense, especially in the first couple decades, that moderate-sized animals such as deer have an extremely difficult time moving through it at all. Conifer tree plantations just are not suitable habitat for much of anything. In fact, conifers form the woods of the west and the far north. In the west, they are able to resist the dry conditions. And at altitude and in the far north, they are able to resist the extreme cold. But boreal environments do not offer much in the way of biodiversity. Because, to put it simply, a wide range of species does not benefit from a boreal forest. The landscape you see below may be green, but in many ways it is already dead. What you see is the ghost of a forest and a realm of endless clear cuts and tree plantations that stand in silent testimony to a degree of greed and willingness to destroy that goes beyond words. Right down there, center screen, are more clear cuts and tree farms in the works. And the very same outside the port window. Let's take a look at this region via satellite imagery, courtesy of Google Earth. We are looking at this region from the equivalent of 193.56 kilometers altitude. And we are flying this route from Miramichi to Fredericton fairly directly. Away from the urban areas and the main roads, the pale patches that you see almost always represent clear cuts, and the darker patches very frequently are formerly clear cut forests now in partial regrowth. So if I were to highlight the landmass area that has been clear cut over the last few decades, we would get, well, we would get this. With exceptions beside urban areas and roads, but everywhere you would go, the forest of New Brunswick has been cut and often is being transformed into borealizing tree farms. We're looking outside the airplane again to give you a clearer perspective. Quite literally, you cannot look anywhere and not see this. 
the devastated landscape of a destroyed forest, bare eroded earth, butchered and glyphosate poisoned woods as far as the eye can see. The only other time I've seen environmental damage this extensive was when examining satellite imagery of the eastern region of the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. Data indicates that Canada is now one of the worst nations in the world for deforestation. And there is the evidence, incontrovertible, written in the land. And I'm going to emphasize again, the Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is not creating for you a fictional landscape. Everything that you see outside the simulated aircraft is taken directly from satellite imagery. All the flight simulator does is use a technology called photogrammetry to present that imagery in a three-dimensional perspective so that pilots can use it for training. So if you were to go there, you would see the exact same thing. The flight simulator merely portrays what is really there, such as that vast sea of clear cuts and bare eroding earth out the starboard window and an endless web of forestry access roads everywhere, just down there, in every single direction. We'll be at the Fredericton Airport in just a few minutes. I'll just fine tune the autopilot and we'll take a moment and zoom in on the devastation down there. Devastation is the only adequate word I can think of. Look out the poor window down there. That's nothing but clear cut, four shortly to be clear cut, and tree planting operations and development. And as you have seen for yourself, the entire route looks like this. The entire landscape between Miramichi and Fredericton, and it goes well beyond that. This is simply the route that I chose to fly because many New Brunswickers will be familiar with this area to some degree. This is heartbreaking and tragic that Canadians would allow their own country, their own environment, to be obliterated like this. The once beautiful forest of New Brunswick, famous throughout the world for their autumn colors, known among scientists as an important biodiversity bank, the unique Acadian forest which once made New Brunswick so special, it's just destroyed. It's gone. I mean, look at the the incredible expanse of this forestry operation. It, it just goes on forever. When I decided to do a virtual flight over New Brunswick to show what might be going on in the province off the main roads, I, I honestly was not expecting anything like this. I had expected something like the significant but potentially recoverable damage around the Kedronkujik National Park. This, there are no words. In the hands of the New Brunswick government and forestry cartels such as Irving, the forests of New Brunswick have just been obliterated. I can't even wrap my mind around how an individual could be part of destruction like this and then manage to sleep at night. The GPS indicates we're about 25 miles north by northeast outside of Fredericton. So if you need to go there and confirm for yourself this is real, by all means do so follow those forestry access roads back there and take a drone and film it from the air because you need to get some altitude to get a real sense of the scale of this. You need some perspective that can only come from getting up in the sky. But the evidence, it's right out there in the New Brunswick landscape. It's inescapable if you just go off the beaten path. The forest of New Brunswick between Fredericton and Miramichi, that entire region, it's an environmental holocaust. And I wish I could say it stopped there, but the satellite imagery over much of the province looks just like this. There you go. Pictures don't lie. Satellite imagery of the whole province. See for yourself. Or just take a flight in a small aircraft and look out the window. When I do these virtual flights, I like to carry them out from airport to airport so that you, the viewer, can experience the flight much as you would as if you were on an actual aircraft. 
And I also want you to get a sense of the true scale of this, which is why I like to go from one airport to the other, which, for those of you living in province, will probably be one familiar location to another. And so, as we approach the Fredericton Airport, I'll just emphasize once again, this is what the landscape looks like between Miramichi and Fredericton. This is what all the landscape looks like. This imagery is unfiltered and unmodified by me. This is simply what satellite imagery reveals of the landscape. And the truth is, I could throw a penny outside of one of the windows of this aircraft every 60 seconds for the entire trip, and that penny's going to land in a clear cut. You cannot look in any direction and not be seeing other than clear cut forest. I don't know how much of the actual native New Brunswick forest still remains, but what I can tell you from this imagery is it's not around here. Remember earlier I said that you could drive down almost any country road, and if you think you're in a deep, healthy forest, just park on the side of the road, get out of your vehicle, and just start walking. Within 100 meters or so, you're very likely to find yourself standing in a clear cut. I'd take it back. After doing this virtual flight, I'd be surprised if you didn't find yourself standing in a clear cut. From what I've seen, I can only conclude that the decisions regarding environment and ecology management in New Brunswick are not simply inept. What do I say? They're simply non-existent? I don't know how policymakers could be this unaware. How could a person possibly be a policymaker in a province like this with a problem this huge and this obvious and not know? The utter devastation of the forest of New Brunswick did not happen by accident. It didn't happen by ineptitude. It happened due to greed willful ignorance, and a government and corporations that simply ignored reality. What you see out this window right now, those clear cuts to the horizon, that's where your missing deer and your declining wildlife have gone. They've gone the way of New Brunswick's forests. They have fallen to the endless hunger of the forestry cartels and a provincial government that simply never did its job. Just over there, outside the starboard window, we can see ourselves coming to the outskirts of the city of Fredericton. Low to center window, what we're looking at right now are outlying suburbs with a city in the distance. And while urban sprawl is an environmental problem, take note of how minuscule this city is in this, what should be a sea of forest. It's not the urban sprawl that's the problem, at least not in this province. It's cutting these forests for timber and pulp and very likely biofuel being sent to Nova Scotia, local plants, or somewhere off overseas. Who knows? But it's not farms in New Brunswick's little towns that have destroyed the New Brunswick woods. When a forest is being cut on this scale, something else is happening. I hope New Brunswickers will find the wherewithal and the will to demand of their government what? Get answers and change things before your environment is entirely destroyed. All right, we're gonna kill the autopilot here and just start our descent. There's the Fredericton Airport just down there. Even here, only a handful of miles outside of Fredericton, we still find the clear cuts in the tree farms. But as always, near the main roads, such as over there, you can't see the clear cuts. Most of the clear cutting happens away from population centers. And if it is near roads where it would be visible, often cosmetic hedges are left up to conceal the damage. The primary exception to this would be private landowners cutting their woods for various reasons. This practice of keeping the massive scale of the clear cuts away from the public eye is a long-standing sleight of hand to keep people from seeing, becoming angry, and demanding change. But we're not even 10 miles outside of Fredericton now, 
So if anybody in that area feels like they need to go out of their town and see, you could get in your car and get on any of these logging access roads and be in the middle of that clear-cut mess in 20 minutes or less. It's a sad shame what's become of this beautiful country. I remember passing through New Brunswick many years ago. In the days I spent a lot of time traveling and exploring the wildernesses of the world. I had intended to travel up New England and the Canadian East Coast, then west and up to Alaska. And I remembered New Brunswick as a place of such astounding beauty. And to know that now so much of that is gone. It truly is a tragedy. Not just a tragedy but the devastation of a landscape, of a forest of this scale. Somehow, to me, it strikes me as criminal, like a crime against humanity, a great sin against Earth and the people who dwell upon her. I, I guess you can tell I'm, I am really struggling to find words to adequately describe what I have seen here. I, I knew it was bad, but I had no idea the state of the New Brunswick forest was this bad. It it's just, honestly, when you take it all in, beyond comprehension. All right, I'm going to bank right and begin dropping more altitude as we cross over the river and prepare to end our virtual flight by setting down at that runway up ahead, just coming into our 12 o'clock perspective. The weather is clear and the simulator isn't creating any unsteady winds at the moment, so this will be a simple landing. We'll just cross the water and touch down. Thank you for joining me on this virtual flight over New Brunswick's forests. It couldn't have been easy for you. It wasn't easy for me. But it's important that what's really going on out there become known. And this new technology, photogrammetry, which converts satellite imagery into a very good three-dimensional rendition of reality. Thanks to it, I think it's going to become harder and harder for those who wreaked this destruction to keep it in the shadows. While I do the final landing maneuvers, I'll just show you to the right of the screen the satellite image of the route we flew again. Whether looking over the New Brunswick landscape from the altitude of an aircraft or the great heights of a satellite, the devastation, the near entire loss of the Acadian forest is evident. It is in fact undeniable. And it is my hope, for those of you who have found the wherewithal to watch this film all the way through, that you will take this video and share it. Feel free to distribute it. New Brunswickers need to know what has really become of their land, their once beautiful province. And then, perhaps united, you can hold those who have allowed this to happen accountable and bring some semblance of sanity back to the New Brunswick government's environmental policy making. And then, find the wherewithal to vote out a government that would so entirely give itself over to corporate interests as to become a mere corporate vassal, and instead put in place politicians who actually care about their land and the people who dwell there.